praise again thank you Jesus praise the Lord you may have your seats in the presence of our life changing king his name is Jesus so tonight I just want to share this teaching again here we grow again we're growing up before we go up we're not trying to get more Jesus we're just trying to know more about the Jesus we already have because the Jesus we already have is enough Jesus to do all things to accomplish all things to have all things as it relates to righteousness joy and peace as it relates to financial prosperity soul prosperity in terms of our souls being saved our mind and our emotion and will being subject to the word of God, being subject to us because we're able to cast down imaginations and every high thing that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God and having a readiness, glory to God, to bring those things subject. Amen. And so even with that, even with that, even with that, casting down the imagination, all the high things that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God and bringing them into obedience amen, into captivity, even to the obedience of Jesus Christ. So we, we don't fly off the handle because, again, we stop in the name of love. Jesus Christ, he is love. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He who loves not knoweth not God because God is love. We stop in the name of love. So, again, tonight I just want for us to understand that we got all the Jesus we're going to get. If you're saved, you got all the Jesus you're going to get. You just need to know more about the Jesus you already got. So here we grow again. Grow how? Grow how? We're growing in the grace and in the knowledge. The grace God riches at Christ's expense. Grace, 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 gr God's helping hand. Grace, gratis. Meaning it's not something that you earn nor deserve. It's something that was simply given uh, out of the will and the heart of a person. But we know that God, he takes pleasure in the prosperity of his service. He wants us to do better. Not just monetarily. He wants us to do better relationally, familiarly. He wants us to do better. He wants us to be better mothers, better, better fathers. He wants us to be better sons, better daughters. He wants us to be better. Amen. And so he takes pleasure in that. He wants to, us to, to do better. And so therefore he has to facilitate the better that he desire of us. Because without him, we can do nothing. Jesus said, without me, you can't do anything. You can't do anything that pleases the Father. You can't do anything that is glorious or good. You can't do anything that has real gain as it relates to the things of the Spirit. You may be able to do some things, but those things that you do without me will become rubbish because what profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul because God wasn't in it, amen? And so when God is not in it, the soul is out of control. The soul is given in to a northern affection, even the lust. So when a person is led away and strays away, it's not God that tempt them. It's that they've been led astray by their own soul of anointed affection that is called lust. So it's our lust, not love. It's lust. I said not love that causes us to stray and to miss God. 
to miss God, to miss God. Even when the boat comes to rescue, God sends that boat. Amen. So don't ask God, why didn't he rescue you? <laughs> he sent the boat. He sent the boat. He sent someone your way. Amen. And so tonight, I just want to uh, talk to us from uh, a, the standpoint or theme of, uh, uh, of Elohim, Elohim, Elohim. Elohim, our God, Elohim. Elohim, E-L-O-H-I-M, Elohim. Elohim, say that, Elohim. He's our God, he's our God. He's the God of creation. He created everything. And everything that he created, he said it was good. But when he made man, see, man is not a thing, glory to God. He created everything, and he said that it was good, but when he made man, he said it was very good, not just good. God said it was very good when he created man because man was made in his image and in his likeness. Anything that's, that's like God has to be very good. Somebody give him praise. He made me. Hallelujah. 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 And so previously I've taught several lessons as it relates to the names of God. I ministered concerning Jehovah Jireh. And you know that Jeho Jehovah Jireh is uh, translated the Lord who provides. And we know that we get that from Genesis. Go with me there. Genesis chapter 22. And when you look at verse number 14, where Abraham he called, uh, again, uh, and Abraham called the name of that place uh, Jehovah Jireh, as it is said uh, to this day, as it is said to this day. To this day, he's Jehovah Jireh. Not only said, but experienced. Hasn't he shown up in your life? Haven't you gone through something and you said, Jesus, you called upon the name of the Lord, you began to pray you began, you began to cry out unto God, and he showed up. In other words, he provided for you. And even to this day, he's still Jehovah Jireh. And we know the story of Abram, how he went up on the mountain with his son to sacrifice his son. And uh, we come to know that once he prepared the altar, he laid his son up on the altar, prepared to take his son life by way of offering him up unto God. And God stayed his hand. Abraham, 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 he called out his name. When you call out God's name, he's sure to call yours. Are you hearing me? He will call you back. He will call you by name. The scripture says he knows his sheep by name. Glory to God. He knows the number of hair on your head. And he provides exactly what you need. He knows your size. He knows your appetite. He knows your likes, your dislikes. He even knows your idiosyncrasies. You understand? He even understands the eccentric ways that you have. Our fickleness, he understands. But yet he understands we have to. Anything that is not like God, we have to give over to him. We have to give over to him because he is a consuming fire. And what he wants to consume is anything that is about us that doesn't bring him glory. That's why he baptizes us with not only the Holy Ghost, but he baptizes us with fire. Jesus baptizes with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And the fire baptism is that Jesus said, come with me. I need to show you what a perfect father is like. I want to show you what a loving, caring, and sharing heavenly father. The one I told you to pray to when you pray, say, I'm a father with which art in heaven, let me show you what he's like. He's a consuming fire. And don't worry, he won't take your life. You're going to be saved. You're going to be spared. But it's just the things, uh, glory to God, that will contaminate the things that would hinder his ability to bring forth and bless and to increase as he's taking joy in the prosperity he has to remove. In other words, when God calls the way, he has to clear the way after having confirmed the way so that he can make a way. Somebody give him praise. He provides. He provides. He provides. He provides. He will clear the way. 
things that need to be bulldozed. He would clear the way. Earth movers, he would clear the way so that we can increase, so that we can be blessed. And he prepared for Abraham a realm that was in the bush. Not just on any hill, but on a specific hill or mountain. God did not say abracadabra when Abraham prepared to sacrifice Isaac. God just didn't uh, hocus pocus. He didn't flail some, some pixie dust. No, no, no. It was already prepared. Had, had, had Abraham not obeyed what the Lord was saying, his son could have been offered. Simply because he didn't go God's way, he went his way. And when you go God's way, he will always prepare the way. Oh, you're hearing me. So God said to Abraham, I will show you. He says, just go and I will show you. So we have to rely on God's guidance. We have to rely on God's direction. We have to come to know his voice. How do we come to know his voice? By spending time with him. See, some people are so fleshly, they can't hear God when he speaks. They can't hear him when he speaks because they're so fleshly. But God wants to lead us and guide us and provide for us. That's why he wants to lead us beside the still waters because you can end up going your way and you end up in white water rapids. You end up losing your life because you're in the wrong water. He said, I will lead you beside the still waters. You understand? In other words, he, he wants us to go into a place of peace and where there's no trepidation and no opportunities of fear because he's removed anything that would prevent us from fully relaxing, relying, and relating to what he's doing in that moment. Are you all hearing me? Come on, ladies. Some of you, I know we have most ladies in our church anyhow. Glory to God, but we need to change that. But at the same time, you know how it is. I said you got to be able to relax. You got to be able to be vulnerable. Not just ladies, I'm speaking of men, but some of you, you know you can't go where you want to go if, 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 if things are not placid. Hello? Are you hearing me? He wants us to go there. Yeah, I got some witnesses. And that's what it's like when he leads us beside the still waters so that we can experience truly what he's like. And some people, and ladies, you know what I'm talking about, never get there because they, they don't have the right man for that. Because there's something that causes them to cringe, to hold back. Something that, 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 that uh, is still unanswered. Where, where guards are up. But God says you need to let down your guard. Don't just put your egg in, in my basket, in one basket, and another basket an egg, and another basket an egg. You know, you, you put all your eggs in my basket because I'm not going to lose any. Glory to God. I know they're, they're sensitive. I know they're vulnerable to breaking. I know they're vulnerable. I know they, they're, they're sensitive to pressure. But God's, my goodness, we serve a great God. He knows what we need. Amen. Let me teach this. Let me teach this. Glory to God. So he named that place what? Jehovah Jireh, right? And we know that Jehovah Jireh means uh, the Lord, my provider. He's God who provides for us. And when we go to Philippians chapter 4, go there with me. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. And it says, but my God, my God might supply, my God will try to supply. So shells are loaded. Shells are loaded with not only 
with promises, but they are loaded with provision. Those shells are loaded. Anytime God says it shall, then it's guaranteed. It's not open for discussion, deliberation, nor debate. It's not open for mitigation and litigation. God says it will come to pass. And he says, but my God, Paul says, shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Don't you know we serve a wealthy God who says that the earth is mine and all that are in it is mine? I'm the God of the cattle of a thousand hills. So we don't have to uh, challenge God or try and uh, there's a financial term. When, when you, uh, for accounts, not consolidate accounts, um, when you challenge to see if the records add up, come on, give me the name for that. Not audit is good. I'll take that if I can't think of the other one. But audit will work. So you know. So let me just go with that until that word comes to reconcile. Reconcile the accounts. Thank you so much. I know it comes to me. Just take a minute. Hallelujah. I know I'm slow coming, but I'm worth the wait. Isn't that right, first lady? Hallelujah. But, but reconcile, rec reconcile the account. So you don't have to come in and try and reconcile God's account. We know he's the God of the abundance. He's the God of the good and plenty. He's the God of the support, supply, and the surplus. He's the God who is able to do what? Exceeding abundantly, to do rather, exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. We serve a God whose, uh, whose flow will never dry out. Glory to God. His flow is upon us because we're in God's favor. We're in God's favor. We're in God's favor. We're in God's favor. When, God, when we do what God wants us to do, we, we begin to flow in favor. I mean, we begin to walk in favor. We, we begin to speak in favor. We, be, favor. we begin to do in favor. I mean, everything is favorable. How it doesn't look, it's favorable. So, tell your neighbor, it's favorable. It's favorable. Yeah, yeah, what's happening? It's favorable. It's favorable. It's, it's favorable. Not only is it, is it possible, but it shall. Glory. He said it shall. It's imminent. You can bank on it. God's promises are good. And the reason I know they're good, you know what I often say, look around, take a breath. If you're able to look around and take a breath and you're still here, I say God's word is still good. Because he said, before one dot of the eye and one crossing of the T of my word fails, heaven and earth will cease to exist. Glory to God. I, I can sh Glory to God. I'm still here. That tells me God is yet faithful. He's yet working out what I can't figure out. He's still perfecting in me the things that concerns me. He's still my Jehovah Jireh. I don't care what they say. I don't care what they do. He's still my Jehovah Jireh. You can take your job. Because the job you gave me don't even belong to you. Because you're taking it from me, I'm telling you, you're putting yourself in a bad place. Because the God I serve who provides for me said, I will contend with those who contend with you. Come on, you're putting your job in jeopardy. You start fooling with me in my favor. He's my God. He provides according to his riches, not your riches, not your grace, his grace. He's not just talking to the preacher, Lauren, when he says, touch not my anointed. You've been anointed by God. You saved. You sanctified. You meet for the master's use. You're a child of the king. You got God's anointed Christos. Are you hearing me? Touch not my anointed. And do my prophet no harm. Who, who a prophet? Aren't you saying what God says? Prophecies thus said the Lord. You don't come a rub, a show. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. You can speak. I'm not minimizing heavenly language and all of that. It's what God says. 
Hello. It's what God says. That's prophecy. Now, yes, we can prophesy in an unknown tongue and that, but you, you quote God's scripture, you prophesy it. He says, son of man, prophesy and say to these dry bones. <laughs> Somebody give it praise. You got to just say it. Just say it. Come together. Be made whole again. Get in order. Kind of like uh, that movie Avatar, the first one. He got up on that, that flying dragon, what do they call those things? Help me out. Well, he got up on that flying thing for the first time, and he connected. And, I mean, he was flying all over the place. He told that thing to, 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 to settle down, straighten up, and fly right. Glory to God. He just said to it, settle down, straighten up, fly right. Glory to God. And that's what you have to say. Just prophesy, tell it, settle down, straighten up, fly right. Be right. Go right. It has to obey. It has to obey. What, has, what is trying to take a left turn in your life? And you know it's supposed to be right. Prophesy. Give him praise. Come on, give him praise. For he shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So we must believe who God is in order to receive what God says. Let me say that again. We must believe who God is in order to receive what God says. Jesus told the ten leopards, that they were healed. But notice they approached Jesus. They approached Jesus because they recognized who he was. Now, if he was just any other person, they would go the other way because, again, it was illegal and unlawful for them to be in their uncleanliness to be around people. But they recognized the, that grace and mercy was in their midst. They recognized the one who came to mend the brokenhearted, the one who came to set, set the captives free. They recognized who he was, and they approached Jesus, and Jesus told them. He told them that they were healed, and he said, now go and show yourself to the priests. So according to the scripture, as they went they were healed. So you have to know who he is in order to receive what he says. And what did they do? They walked out on his word. Jesus said, go and show yourself. They didn't question it. Oh, well, I can't do that. I'm not healed. My skin looks the same. What you trying to do to me? You trying to get me killed. To walk up on the priest. But he says, no, go show yourself. I said you're healed. So you got to know that he's your provider. Even when it doesn't look like that he's making the provision. You need to step out on his word. You have to step out on what he says based upon your faith in him. And nothing else. Amen. He's Jehovah Jireh. He's your provider. He provides healing. He provides our deliverance. Amen. And we know how Peter stepped out on his word when he said, come. Just one word from God changes everything. If it be thou bid me to come, God will have you do miracles on one word. He will have you do what naysayers are saying is impossible. I tell you what, you got to know for yourself that when God says it, he can bring it to pass and he shall bring it to pass because he is a God who cannot lie. He cannot lie. He cannot lie. Just one word from God will put you in the miracle working zone. When nobody said that you could, you end up doing because you know who he 
is. That's why I say we don't need no more Jesus. We just need to know more about the Jesus we already have. Just like you have gadgets and games and electronics in your house. You've had them for 15 and 20 years and you still don't know everything about it. You're discovering things 10 years later. You're discovering, I didn't know it did that. Well, I, I bought two or three more because, well, it, you bought two or three more because you didn't know what you already had. Are you hearing me? You just need to know more about the Jesus you already have. Let me have just a few more moments. I said he's Elohim. He's the all-powerful one. He's the creator of all things. God that knows it all creates it all. He's able to create us new worlds when our world is shattered, when our space has been infiltrated. Whatever your space is, whatever that thing is, whatever has been broken and shattered, whatever has been rendered inoperable, God is able to create it anew and afresh. Just like he didn't need to kill you to make you new. He made a new you with what the you you gave to him. Come on, somebody. I said he made new the portion of the you that you gave to him. He's the God of creation. And this God of creation is the God who is Elroy. Say Elroy. E-L-R-O-I. Go ahead and write it down. E-L-R-O-I. Elroy is the God who sees. So he's Elohim. He's the God of creation. He's also Jehovah Jireh. Jesus, yes, he's all that. So when we speak of the names of God, again, they are compound names that describes the nature or attributes of God. Elohim, Elohim, the God of creation. When you read Genesis uh, chapter 1, the fourth word is, is God. In the beginning, God. That's number four. Say so that in the beginning, God. Say it again. That's how it starts. In the beginning, God. Well, where did God come from? When did he do it? He did it in the beginning. He was in the beginning. In the beginning, God. The fourth word is the name God, Elohim. So he's the God of creation. In the beginning, God created. So that's Elohim. He created uh, the north, the south, the east, and the west. He created the four seasons, uh, spring, summer, fall, winter. He created. He created. Number four represents earth. He's the God of creation, but he's also the God who sees. Say that he's the God who sees. Yeah, yeah, he's the God who created, but he's also the God who sees. The God who sees is Elroy. He is Elroy, not El Dorado, not El Segundo. I said he's Elroy. Come on, he's Elroy. He's the God who sees. He's the God who sees. Not only does he see, but specifically, he's the God who sees me. Of the billions of people that are on the face of the planet, he's still able to see me. Just like his eye is upon the sparrow, so are his eyes are upon me. His eyes are upon you. So don't think for a moment that God is disinterested and he doesn't care and that God has forgotten about you. He says, I'm not a God who's unrighteous to forget your labors of love because I see you. He said to the churches of Asia Minor, I see you. I know your works. He's the God who sees me. And so 
uh, I want to give you just three uh, uh, points, three points uh, uh, or descriptive characteristics or attributes about Elroy. Elroy. Jesus is Elroy. So the translation of Elroy is commonly, again, God who sees, but, but he sees me. Elroy is a descriptive epithet of God using El, the word El, E-L, which means God, and a modifier indicating a quality of God, a quality of God. It was first mentioned in the book of Genesis. You find it in Genesis chapter 16, verse 13, and we know the story of Hagar and how Hagar was kicked out of Abraham's camp. Her and her son, and she was in the wilderness. Sometimes we find ourselves in wilderness places. We feel isolated, isolated rather. We, we, we feel as if we are lost in the shuffle and can't find our way out of the maze of life. Being thrown into the middle, right in the midst of chaos. But I want you to know when we cry out unto God, God sees us and he hears our cry. He saw Hagar. He heard her cry. He saw Ishmael. He heard his cry. That's where that term or name of God was first mentioned. There in Genesis chapter 16, verse number 13. Now write these three points down before we close. We have to understand he's Elroy. He's the God who sees me. He's a God who knows me. He is a God who's able to bless me. He's a God who able, who's able to restore what the canker worm, the locusts, the devouring locusts have stolen, have eaten those things that the enemy has stolen. He knows how to return them even with interest. He knows how to bless. And my God shall supply all your need. All your need. Number one, he's Elroy, the God that sees and watches over me. Write that down. He's the God that sees and watches over me. Again, God is omniscient. God is omnipotent. God is omnipresent. In other words, he has all knowledge. He has all power, and he has uh, all presence everywhere at the same time. And we know that the devil is not omnipresent. He just runs really fast. You understand? <laughs> Glory to God. He, he, he just runs really fast, but he's not everywhere in the, in the same place at the same time. Only God can do that. And so I want you to know he's there because Proverbs 15 and 3 says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. Even when Adam and Eve fell and hid themselves, God saw them. He sees our condition. He sees our circumstance. But the question is, Will you recognize him in the midst of what you're going through? In the midst of what you're facing? Because some people get so discouraged that they can't even recognize God when he shows up. Shell shock. Boom. You're jumping at everything. Everything's the devil. Everything's the devil. Looking for bad news. No, every, at every turn. Did y'all get the text this morning? Yeah, just like that. End up with a hardened heart. Can't celebrate nothing. But you have to know that he's there, he's, he's there, he's everywhere. So since he's there, you might as well put your faith in him. 
Since he's there, you might as well trust in him that he will clean you up, that he will forgive you, that he will restore you, that he will make your wrong right, that he will remove the thing that has been twisted and broken in you, the wrong words, the wrong thoughts. He's there. He's there. He's there. He's there in your flood. He's there in your fire. He's there. He's there. He sees and he knows. He's the God who sees and watches over me. He's there. So don't let sin cause you to hide. Don't let sin cause you to lie. Don't let sin cause you to cheat. Because he that strives for the mastery must first also strive lawfully. First thing first is to put our faith, trust, and confidence in him. You can't make yourself right. You can't get it right. The reason can't get right didn't get right because he didn't look right. He didn't look unto Jesus, who's the author and the finisher of our faith. So God asked Adam, where are you? What are you thinking? What are you believing? Here's the question for you. What are you receiving? You don't have to settle for less than what God wants you to have. He said he takes joy. He says, I take joy in your prosperity. I don't take joy when you, uh, uh, you're subtracting from your life, when you're diminishing your life, when you're making a, a, a muck of your life. He says, I want to take pleasure in the prosperity. So what are you looking at? What are you thinking about? What are you believing? What are you receiving? The scripture James, in James chapter number uh, 1, verse 8 says, A double-minded man, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Don't you know when you're unstable, everything in your life is unstable? When you're, when you're double-minded, when you're double-minded, there is no st stability in your life whatsoever. Any place you have any dealings with or in, any relationship you've entered into, any fellowship you're a part of is unstable. Because if you're double-minded, it says you're, you're unstable in all your ways. In all your ways. When you look at our government, we say in God we trust. We say that, but then you look what's happening even in our, our world, in, in our nation. The instability that we have. We have a lot of people in leadership, double-mindedness. And if there's double-mindedness, there is instability. And we are seeing that happening even before our very eyes. But yet, we believe God. Say that, I believe God. I believe God. And I believe God that he's going to override undo what the enemy has done because of our righteousness of him. Our righteousness, which is of him, rather that is found in Jesus Christ. And so that's why we are praying. That's why we're interceding. Maybe I'll preach on prayer Sunday about our being prayers, not just praying and offering up prayers, but we need to be prayers. Not praying prayers. We need to be prayers. You understand? Prayers. We, we need to pray without ceasing because the world needs the church to stand up and make intercession Oh, my, my, my. Intercession now. 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 We can't wait another hour, another day, another month. We need to intercede because those things that are happening in our world must be spiritually discerned. As I said, it's not a skin problem. What kind of problem is it? It's a sin problem. And we need to stand. Amen? All right, I got five minutes. I gave you number one was that uh, L. Roy does what? He's the God that sees and watches over me. Write this down. Number two, L. Roy, he's the God who sees and knows what's wrong in me and with me. 
He is the God who sees and knows what is wrong in and with me. Again, the world is full of lust of the flesh and lust of the eye and the pride of life. I've taught you the three P's as it relates to that. What is the first one? The prosperity in life. The lust of the flesh. So it's the what? The prosperity of life. Then we have, you have a desire for the possessions in life. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, possession in life. Pos Stay with me. Let me let me just, Minister Lisa, come on, you want to preach it. Hallelujah. Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. The lust of the flesh is the prosperity in life. The lust of the eye, the possessions in life. And the uh, pride of life, which is the position or the prominence in life. And so that's what's in the world. That's what we find in the world. And so that if we're desiring things and not him, if we're seeking out the things and not him, that's wrong. That's wrong. We, we have the inordinate affection of lust. We're seeking after the things and not the king. He sees the lust. He sees the fleshly living, the fleshly dealings, the fleshly conversations, the carnality in our thinking, he sees it. But I want you to know he knows how to supply all your need. Not what you want, but what you need. We find Hagar back in Genesis chapter 21, how God asked Hagar, what was wrong with you? Again, God talks to us because a lot of times just talking to God is therapeutic, even in itself. You go to some people, go see the shrink. And the shrink just took, lay, lay down on the couch, talk to me. They just lay there, feet up on the couch, just talking. And you get up and say, boy. I feel so much better. You did 95% of the talking. But just knowing that you had a listening ear. God asked Hagar, what's wrong with you? Tell me, tell me. God knows. But he says, now I want you to tell me. That's why the scripture says that we must confess our sin. Don't you know God knows our sin? But the scripture says if we confess our sin. God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and he will cleanse us of all unrighteousness. What sin am I talking about? Right now I'm talking about the sin of unbelief. It's because you can't believe God can do it. That's why you're stressing. That's why you're acting the way you're acting. That's why you're doing what you're doing because of the sin of unbelief. You don't believe God can do what he said he's going to do in your life. So are you a part of us or them? You know the thems didn't mix. <laughs> the word preached unto them with their faith. Again, so God wants us to talk it out, confess it. That's why David, David was a man that God says is after my heart. David. Conspired to commit murder. David committed adultery. Dereliction of duty. Supposed to be out in battle. There was a time where the kings were supposed to be uh, leading their armies, but he is uh, uh, committing voyeurism. Peeking Tom. Mm, 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 mm. Hello. Look so good, man. Who? Send a certain man, find out who, her, her husband. We got to get rid of him. Uriah, her husband, found out, okay, I'm sending, he only, he's going to lead the charge. I don't care if he's trained or not, put him up front. But yet, he's a man after God's own heart. He became the man after God's own heart 
when he repented, when he said, Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew the right spirit. He knew his spirit was wrong. And some of us, we got a wrong spirit. The reason we're not walking in the overflow, the reason we're not having and experience the favor of God, because we got a wrong spirit, a bad spirit. He said, create in me clean heart. Renew in me right spirit. And when we say that and do that, it pleases God. Repentance is being placed into the high place again. Amen? And God says, now that's the kind of man I want. One that understands who I am and what I will do when you call upon me. And he cried out unto the Lord. And God did exactly what he said he would do. Amen? Number three, Elroy, the God who sees and knows how to restore right in me. And I just made mention of that, but I want you to see the scripture in Psalm 51. Just go there, Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Where he says, now have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. What is iniquity? Iniquity Yes, inward sin, that which is on the inside that is bent, twisted, and broken. That which would cause people to do unspeakable things. Things that are unimaginable. Things that are disgusting, immoral, unethical, and even unlawful. Iniquity. And try and cover it up and hide it. He says, even my iniquity. You see it in your Bible? He said, wash me thoroughly from it. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression. And my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil. Again, I did it backwards. I didn't do it forward. Forward is having faith in God. Forward action and trusting in God. In other words, if you don't do it forward, you're doing it backwards. To live is to go forward. To, to be evil is to live backwards. And he says this evil, you see it there? He says that, might, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest. And he said, be clear. When thou judgest, behold, I was shapen in what? Iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. In other words, we got to come clean so that we don't stay, ha uh, have to stay away dirty. If you don't come clean, you would always be dirty. Because if you don't come clean, there's something that is still unchecked. There is still something that hasn't been dealt with by the blood of Jesus. And you can, you can spill oil, a gallon of oil, onto the ground and cover it up with fresh dirt. But over time, that oil that you covered up is going to seep through the top layer. For a moment, it looks like, oh, that's good and nothing's there. But just give it time. I said, just give it time. So to do it the right way, when you see the spill, dig it up. His word is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of the joint, the marrow, the soul, and the spirit. His word is a discerner of every thought and intent of the heart. When we come clean, he goes in with a clean cut. He makes an incision in us with precision to cut out and to root out whatever it is that are in our inward parts that will cause us, that will cause us to forego the provisions that he desires 
for us to have because he wants us to do better. He wants us to have more. He wants us to be more than what we are. Amen? Somebody ought to give him, ought to give him some praise. And when you go down to verse 12, what I just quoted, restore unto me the joy. Well, I quoted up to verse number 10, but verse 12 says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. So everyone has had something broken and destroyed in their lives. Everybody here has had something that has been broken or destroyed. And it causes hurt. And hurt can and has caused hate. Think about that hurt. What was on the heel of that hurt? hate. Sometimes it causes us to even hate hearing about God. You ever been going through something, someone trying to encourage you and tell you what God is, is going to do? And, and in your, some of you probably told them, but within, now I don't want to hear nothing about no God. Are you hearing me? Don't want to hear about God and what he can and will do. And that's when Psalm chapter 100 and verse 1 reminds us of the fact that uh, we can make a joyful noise unto the Lord and that we can serve him with gladness, that we can come before his presence with singing because if we would just hear what God has to say, God will restore us as we begin to praise him, as we begin to magnify him, as you forget about your trouble, as you forget about the hate and start focusing on his love, what you don't have, and focus on what he has and what he said. He turns that sadness into gladness. He turns the mourning into joy. He turns it into dancing when we begin to praise him and magnify him in the midst of it. That's why David said, I will bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord. I'm not going to bless my circumstance. I'm not going to bless and strengthen my situation by being sad, lagging, dragging, sagging, murmuring, complaining. But no, begin to just prophesy. Say what God says. And I promise you that El Roy is going to turn it around. He will turn it around. Say, he will turn it around. Yes, he will. He will turn it around just for you. 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 Why just for you? Because 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 says, And the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But, verse 9, see that's what happens to those who don't recognize that he's Elroy. Those are the ones who Say, God abandoned me. He left me. Where was he when I went through this, when my baby died and this? Where was God? There is no God. If there was a God, he wouldn't have allowed this thing to be. That's the verse number eight. 
confession. That's the position of those who are in verse 8. But verse 9, but verse 9 says, but ye are chosen generation. In other words, I chose you. I've chosen you for this, for my glory and for my honor, for my splendor. I've chosen you for this so that there can be a demonstrative witness of my blessings upon your life. You are a royal priesthood. He says, you're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, a peculiar people. A peculiar people. A peculiar people. Can you say pecuniary? Pecuniary. Pecuniary. Don't you know what that word pecuniary means? Pecuni yeah, pecuniary means uh, that uh, something is worth much. It, it's a word that depicts money. And so what God is saying, I see you where you are. I know what you're going through. But when you call upon me, I'm going to bless you. Not only are you royal because you are, uh, are born into my blessed kingdom as a son and as a daughter, but I want you to know that you are highly valuable. Because not only do I see, but I see you. And I see you not as being worth less but I see you as being invaluable. We mean something to God. When he sees you, he sees something in you that is what? Valuable. You are a high price people. You are high price people. And you're so valuable that nothing will separate you from God's love. No matter what you're going through, no matter where you are, in your low place. And sometimes we go, in order to get, in order to, get to the mountaintop, sometimes you got to go through the valley. But I want you to know he's there. He's there. He's there. That's why he's the rose of Sharon and the lily that's in the valley. I'm encouraging you even when you're at your low point. When you feel like, 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 like nothing will ever change. He says, let me just remind you that I got a covenant with you. Like Paul told Timothy, his son, I know it's difficult right now. Even I'm about to be executed. But I want you to stir up that gift that is in you. I need for you to stir it up. Don't you begin to get be sad for me. Don't begin to lose your fresh flame of faith over what's happening to me. But you need to stir up Rohi and, and Elroy that is within you. Amen? How, you, how do you stir up that faith in Elroy? By practicing it. By practicing it. Practice the word that you heard and you will be blessed. Practice the word that you heard and you will be blessed. Practice the word that you heard and you will be blessed. You know why you should practice the word that you heard? Because there's going to come a time when you're going to need to use it. We practice the word we heard in the good times in preparation for the bad. So therefore, we don't react when bad times and difficulties come. We respond based upon what we've already practiced. Somebody give him glory and give him praise. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. And amen. Go ahead. Go ahead. Come on. One more praise. One more praise. Come on. Yes. 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 Yes.
Amen. He's Elroy. He's the God who sees me. He's the God who knows me. He's the God who knows what is right and wrong with me. He is the God who restores. And if you need a special prayer tonight for whatever, whatever reason, maybe for healing in your body,